Welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted, episode 689. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is October 5th, 2021. All right, welcome to another episode. We're glad you're here, and we're glad you're clicking that like button right now. Pop, pop, pop. I love unscripted. Click, click, click here. Seriously, if you're on Facebook or YouTube and you want to help donate to Anglican Unscripted without actually donating, you can donate your likes. You just click that like button. It helps promote the show on the algorithms of Facebook and YouTube, and we notice. Uh, it's showing up in our news feeds more and more the more you're clicking so we really appreciate that uh it helps if you not shared this program with your friends family or foe now's your chance you click that url at the top and you put in an email and say hey have you seen these guys yet they talk about all things anglican most things christian and some things secular and it's kind of fun to listen to sometimes they make sense most of the time they don't if you have not gone to the comment section, now's your chance. You go in there and you put your comments in. Kevin, you were way off today. Or George, why aren't you a bishop yet? Yeah, that type of stuff. And add that to the comment section. So, oh, also, if you really don't want to see us on screen, you can listen to this in audio format only. There's a link to the podcast in the show notes. You can click on it and sign up to receive the podcast automatically on your podcast player on Android or iPhone. George, how have you been doing this week? Wonderful. God mm -hmm. is doing great things in the life of our congregation. We've had a few unexpected deaths. We had a marriage. Uh, oh, I married uh, a couple. She was 19 and he was 22 and he's a corporal in the army. Mm. And they're heading off to Fort Stewart, I think, for his next phase of training. And I'm looking at them and I'm thinking, oh, I pray you guys make it you are so young but uh no yeah. it's just wonderful doing these things and oh well despite covid the life of the church goes on despite mm -hmm. the politics des despite what's happening in culture the life of the church you know not only does it continue it must continue you know the life of the church is our witness uh and amongst other things at the wedding uh wedding and funerals right now are our biggest turnout uh Sunday attendance is still far from where it should be. But to get 200 people for a little country wedding, uh, you know, people from across the congregation wanting to encourage and welcome and help the new couple, people who were children here at one time are now grown up and, and out getting out into the world. It's exciting. Well, I'm part of many uh, Facebook groups that revolve around RVing and full-time RVing, and I see the snowbirds are starting to head south again, George. Uh, some of our friends have already pulled up to Webster, and they parked their RV yesterday, and we're heading down there probably uh, the middle of next month, and you know, I think your congregation size is going to start growing again. Well, I've come to a point where I'm not really, I, yes, I do worry. I, yes, I'm you do. never not what going are you to talking be able to about? worry. Of course you worry. <laughs> but from a hard-headed perspective, income is where it should be. Mm -hmm. It's just attendance that's fallen. Now, if people had walked away, money would, would, would match the decline in attendance. So what I think we're seeing is that people are still a little hesitant to worship in person. And we are getting... Uh, walk-in traffic people wanting to exp people who are basically they're sick and tired of being at home for 18 months they've what played enough video games they've read enough books and it's too hot to play golf so they think well let's try out a church so they, they take off the walmart wear they put on some good sunday clothes and they head off to church and i think we're seeing this more and more i we saw right after people started getting vaccinated church attendance really jumped uh for a couple weeks then delta hit and i'm seeing a, a kind of a smattering return now uh even watching the live feed for our church it's not completely full uh, like it was right after the vaccinations hit. So um, Delta's still having an effect. But God's in charge, and uh, his uh, kingdom is being built with one person converted at a time. Okay. Let's move on to our first story, which is our good news story. We've been doing this now for about two months, 
And uh, people have not been submitting good news stories like I had hoped. So we have to go search or we have to make it sound like a good news story. And uh, George and I are talking in the pre-show. Do we have a good news story? And George says, yeah, but it has to do with Sodom. How could that be a good news story? Well, I just listen to the story. So G George, make Sodom and Gomorrah a good news story. Well, this story has been around for a few months, but it received its legs on uh, on Friday when Eric Metaxas, the uh, podcast uh, radio host, uh, had uh, Professor Stephen Co Stephen Collins mm -hmm. on his show, and they discussed Collins' book, and I'm going to read the title to you, Discovering the City of Sodom. Collins is a professor at Trinity Southwestern University and he's been leading a dig for about 15 years at a site about nine ten miles northeast of the dead sea in jordan uh, with the support of the government of jordan antiquities department and they have found a city that was once a thriving trade at, uh trading town mm -hmm. that was destroyed by what they believe to have been a meteorite and it dates from approximately the time of abraham so what we're seeing is archaeological confirmation of the destruction of the city of Sodom. Now, this is not proof, far from it. But for what for me, the good news is, is that once again, the biblical narrative is, being not, is not being disproven, but again being proven to have had a basis in history. All through the 19th and 20th century, the Germans and American liberal scholars would tell us, oh, the Bible is just a collection of myths, and it's, it's not really true, it's just purely allegorical, none of this ever happened. And, you know, in a stream, there was Bishop Spong saying Jesus didn't die, rise from the dead, or Bishop Jenkins, that the resurrection was a uh, trick, uh, jumbling of old bones, or words to that effect. But now, again and again, we're seeing proof that what these people wrote about, whether it's the existence of kings and it's certain events, and now we have the destruction of a trading city from the heavens by a meteorite around the time that the destruction of Sodom took place in the Bible. We also have uh, archaeological news uh, came out this week that they uh, think they have found the location of Mount Sinai. Sinai. I can't even say it this morning. <laughs> <laughs> one one of, one of the great uh, knocks on the historicity of the Bible was that how could all these Jews wander around Sinai, which is a pretty small place by the time, it's like the size of uh, Connecticut, uh, wander around Connecticut for 40 years. Eventually, you'd come out of it. Well, these scientists are working in uh, northwestern Saudi Arabia, and they have found in a, this particular mountain range uh, archaeological ruins and remains uh, that match the topography and the settings of the story of uh, Mount Sinai from the Bible. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not proof that uh, Mount Sinai is in Saudi Arabia, but the temperate, the t uh, the climate was a little more temperate in those days. It was greener, and this is a lot bigger area to wander around for forty years than the Sinai Peninsula. So, again, the historicity of the Bible is being supported. Now, it's not proven, far from it. But I th just think this is so encouraging that, you know, we've been told, uh, Kevin, our generation, starting with Al Gore, has been, follow the science. science. Believe in the science. And mm -hmm. from Al Gore to uh, Dr. Fauci, it's the science is right. And now the science is telling us that a city was destroyed from the heavens and that there were these things, events took place in this uh, mountain in Saudi Arabia. Well, we're following the science and it says the Bible's true. Yeah. Now, you and I, we were reared in the 80s. Indiana Jones, you know, the search for the Ark of the Covenant. If they find the Ark of the Covenant, it's game over, okay? <laughs> 
<laughs> game no, no, over. Kevin, it, it's in a where, it's in a government warehouse in Maryland. Somewhere. Well, yeah, it's somewhere. Yeah, the, the little the side is the logo is burned off, but you know, it, then it's game over. But you know, it, it's it's nice, and this is part of our, our, our good news series here that nothing has been disproven about uh, scripture, and, and especially in the historical context, which is important because that's what the atheists always look for. So that never happened. Well, you know, now we know it. It had, that never existed. Well, kind of, it did. And science has shown it. Archaeology has shown it. So th that's the good news for this week. Um, we have a whole list of stories. I, I, I got a list here of nine stories. And so... Can, can, can we do the bad England story just to keep in the our, uh... Yeah, let, let's do the, uh, the quagmire uh, in London uh, and the non-geographical geographical diocese that they're trying to set up. So uh, do the quagmire story first, George. Well, Private Eye Magazine, which is, of course, the best source after Anglican Inc. for Anglican stories and Church of England stories. And I'm not kidding. They've no, broken the... <laughs> some great stories. Yeah. Private Eye reports that there was a meeting of clergy, the two cities deanering the Diocese of London this past week. We reported a few weeks ago about a priest a uh, retired priest in the diocese who took his own life. Uh, he was trapped in what was described as a Kafkaesque, never-ending uh, investigation into alleged abuse. But there were no victims, no complainants. It all started because they thought this guy was a little fruity, uh, a little light in the loafers, as my father would say. What the letter said was he he was a little touchy, and that yep. started off the, this this you know storm within his life of how do I defend myself when there's no there's no victims and he took his life and the coroner coroner in the city of London uh, released a report damning the Church of England's bureaucratic indifference and malfeasance and just disregard for natural justice and placing the institutions its self-interest above all well there was a meeting of the clergy in this deanery where this priest was resident who had where he had many friends and essentially they're talking about bringing a motion of no confidence in sarah malali the bishop of london uh which was threatened with tim dake and the bishop of winchester of saying look this the diocese is so out of touch it is so bureaucratic it is so dead from the neck up that it is uh we need change. Sarah Mullally addressed the clergy and ba basically gave the standard mantra of lessons will be learned, um, this and that. But there have been so many things going on at, at a level that just strikes at the rank and file clergy's sense of fairness over the past few years that uh, this may be the tipping point, just as we saw uh, Win Winchester which is in a bucolic, well-endowed well part of Europe, uh, England. Uh, it's one of the nicest places in England. Very nice, and the yes. clergy blew up there. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not as nice. This includes some of the lesser, less uh, uh, grittier parts of London. And the clergy is saying, you know, the hell with it. Uh, they may not be saying that, but no, I think they are. But they're opinions. using English words. <laughs> the heck with that! Ah, yes. uh, so well. we may we may see Sarah Mullally publicly challenged for her managerial incompetence. She's saying, of course, it's the underlings' fault. The underlings are saying, well, we just followed uh, the the guidebooks, and we're just doing what the Church of England wants us to do. So everybody's pointing their finger at each other, and well, the buck should stop with the bishop. And we may see a no confidence motion lodged against her. Now we had talked before about uh, they want to plant a uh, thousand or ten thousand. Ten thousand. Ten thousand new not, not churches, but entities or church-like organizations within the area, and that's becoming more of a fruition as they're trying to put it on paper what it looks like. And you were describing it to me, and I'm like, that's kind of non-geographically geographical it is the, the best diocese, i can put it the diocese of worcester and the church of england is the farthest along on this process mm -hmm. of basically dismantling the ancient parish system in england proper 
every square inch of the country is in a parish and technically the parish priest is responsible for the cure of the souls in that parish so uh, if you never set foot in church your entire life you still have a right to be buried there uh, because that's your parish they're looking to change that and basically centralize things more diocese of worcester is proposing a minster m-i-n S-T-E-R. Not minister, but minster, like Westminster. Yeah, got it. <laughs> a, where you have a, a church that serves as the base for a team of clergy covering a wider geographic area. So today, uh, you know, my church parish technically is, you know, five miles this way, five miles that way, and I basically know all the... When I do funerals for people, usually I, I know them, if, even if I have only seen them in the grocery store. Uh, they never show up. That would be changed to a much broader catchment area, maybe 50 miles by 50 miles. And the uh, clergy would work out of a central minster or cathedral church, if you will, uh, breaking the local link to your local parish. The local parish would still be there, but you get somebody showing up uh, maybe somebody different, maybe it only once a month, uh, not always the same guy or girl. Uh, the, pr the plan is to break the old local, locally based system. Now, the liberals in the Church of England are quite concerned because they see this as basically the Holy Trinity Brompton me method of having charis charismatic evangelical churches that sort of replant themselves and then leaving the old and the poor and the not charismatically inclined to the rest of the church. So that these churches, in essence, would basically try to skim the cream off the top of the population, those already religious or, or young or active or wealthy, and basically drop the aged, drop the people in the housing projects, drop all that and focus the market. Now, in the United States, that's a great idea because we have more than one church. We have a whole uh, marketplace of churches. And so churches try to find their niche. But in England, when you don't have a marketplace, when you have a monopoly of sorts, um, this is a terrible idea, the mm. liberals are saying, because it uh, results in conformity of clergy so that everybody if you're all working out of the same minster with one boss, you're all going to basically be replicas of the boss. You're not going to have that variety that you might have an evangelical parish here, an Anglo-Catholic, a liberal, a charismatic. Um, you're not going to have the variety that you have in the Church of England right now, but it's going to be more uniform in sort of the bland. Uh, I've heard it described as sort of the Tony Blair uh, Church of England. Okay. Uh, I had Blairite. that. Blairites. <laughs> Which evidently, I'm told, is considered to be a terrible, uh, terrible uh, form of abuse, calling somebody a Blairite these year, days. But uh, I don't know. I just mm. listen to people. So, so well, that's that's coming up with the Worcester Synod, and we'll see how far that goes because they'll debate it, and if they accept it, it'll be a major change in the parish system. And we have sort of hint. Yeah, we have hints because both archbishops uh, Cottrell and uh, Welby have taken to the airway of saying, oh, we love the Paris system. It's not in danger. That's when they start talking about it. That's when it's in danger. Yeah, it's interesting to watch you both in the quagmire uh, story we just did in this uh, new vision for the church. The liberals are complaining against the ultra liberals that, you know, this isn't going to go anywhere. Um, I don't know what to see. I, I like to see the implementation of this. You know, I, I do like the idea that uh, it's okay to shake up the old parish system, but I don't think it's okay to replace it. I don't think it's it, it's a replaceable system. One of our contributors, uh, we reprint his stuff. He's an he's an Englisher. Well, Stephen Parsons mm -hmm. uh, writes that the the new mantra in the Church of England is mission. Every third or fourth or fifth word is mission, but nobody ever bothers really to define what mission is. So that part of the part of the problem right now is that we have uh, this management speak coming out of bishops and deans and archdeacons 
about the mission of the church and we're mission focused and mission centered and we're mission this and we're mission that and nobody actually bothers to say well what exactly does mission mean now we all think we know what it means it may mean something for you or for me mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean it means everything the same in England because we speak different languages uh, even uh, we, different dialects of English uh, ours the proper one and theirs funny one so anyway, yes strange but but it, it's this centralization this uh, management uh, ethos uh, that the Church of England is adopting to stave off its collapse looks like it may accelerate the collapse hmm. I mean if you if you've lost the gospel it's not too long before you lose the parish just I'm just saying just saying I'm just putting that out there. Uh, some other stories, a lot of people here may not know that uh, Anglican Unscripted is the sister program of Anglican.inc. And George, you posted a couple uh, Senate, uh, Synod communiques uh, from... <laughs> I don't know what the, that was. Is there something else? Was there? that whiskey or rye or which <laughs> yeah. of the kittens? It was, that was a kitten sneezing. It was weird. And so uh, some of you may not know that Anglican Unscripted is the sister program to Anglican.inc. And George uh, posts many stories from around the communion there, and some Christian stories, and once in a while a secular story, just for variety. We do that. You posted some synod communiques that were posted uh, from uh, GAFCON provinces uh, in Africa. And you and I have talked about this many times, that the earnest and fight and the, the, the lioness that uh, the African provinces had against the Episcopal Church 10, 15 years ago is gone. That we're, they're fighting eternal fights against the Boko Haram, against the radical Islam. They don't have time to focus anything on what's happening in Canada or here in America with the Episcopal Church or even in England. That everything is just focused on their provinces right now. And I read these communiques and I'm like, yep, that's it. They didn't mention anything, even with the Anglican Communion, which they, they often, oh, want to say hi to Justin? Nothing. You know, it was it was all about what's happening on the ground in their provinces. And that's why we're not hearing or we're not seeing leadership come out of Africa on, at the GAFCON level, at the archbishop level, trying to fight the ills we have over here in the West. They have their internal conflicts that they're, they're dealing with, George. Yes, we in the past few weeks, a um, number of GAFCON provinces, Nigeria, Uganda, uh, Nigeria and Kenya, mm -hmm. and non-GAFCON provinces, South Africa, uh, Mozambique, uh, Church of Ireland, a uh, bunch of provinces around the communion held their annual, held, held their general synods. And I can't, and I, going through all, reading all the communiques, I can't find anything about the issues that uh, have animated the communion for the past 25 years. They're all locally focused, a elections forthcoming, the environment, this, that, the other, all the things that are sort of domestic internal concerns, such that they're really not newsworthy for an international audience. Uh, I mean, in a mild, mildly interesting way, they might be, but there's no sense that uh, this is a statement uh, of a, one part of the communion speaking to another. Right. And we can think why this might be, maybe because they're basically sick and tired of wasting their breath and nothing's been ever been done. Or there's been such a change in the players and in the issues that they've found that it's better to focus on the things that they can actually do something about than the things that they're just beating their head against a stone wall with. I don't know. Well, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Here, they're not doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. They've stopped doing it. They've stopped putting out the press releases. Uh, the, the Episcopal Church is evil. The Anglican uh, Church of Canada is evil. Stop doing what you're doing, uh, Canterbury. Stop doing what you're doing, Church of England. It, it's gone silent. And I think they, they just don't want to deal with that right now. And it's interesting because now we're having a big shakeup, especially like in the ACC, where maybe a voice 
out of GAFCON and a voice out of certainly these African provinces may have more effect than they would know what to do with George. Yes, Josiah Dauferon, the ACC General Secretary, is retiring after the Lambeth Conference next mm -hmm. year. Uh, Paul Kong, the Archbishop of Hong Kong, is the chairman of the Anglican Consultative Council. He is stepping down too. So we're going to have new leadership at the top. And some various little side issues arise from that, but one is that the, this is an, one of the instruments of communion, so-called, that the African Global South Church can seize sh simply by sheer numbers and weight mm -hmm. of authority. And of course, if they don't show up, they lose. Now, in the past, the ACC has been funded primarily by the American Church, the Church of England, and the Hong Kong Church. Specifically, the Hong Kong Church will reach into its pocket and give three, four, five hundred thousand dollars for one-off projects. Now, if those who follow the financial news, you've read about Evergrande, the Chinese property developer. Well, Fantasia, the third or fourth largest Chinese property developer, defaulted on its bonds today. And the Chinese property market is in freefall. It's, I don't want to turn into Wall Street week, but Chinese property, the Hong Kong church has, its source of income has been its properties. Uh, last year, we report, two years ago, we reported they, the primate, uh, Archbishop Kuang was, uh, really sucking up to Peking and why would he do this why would he be different from the Chinese Catholics and the Methodists and all the other Protestant leaders who are voicing support for democracy well they needed a zoning variance to turn some of their land in central Hong Kong Island into multi-story apartment blocks and a hospital mm -hmm. and if if they were sticking their thumb in the eye of Peking they wouldn't get the zoning variance so Hong Kong, the church in Hong Kong does, is not cash rich, they're property rich, and they've made their money developing their colonial era properties. That's all going to come to a crashing halt. So they're going to need their income to keep themselves alive. So the flow of cash from Hong Kong is going to stop into the ACC. Trinity Wall Street, its income is derived from rents on real estate it owns in lower Manhattan. My daughter, who works for a large union, um, the union based in Seattle is now having everybody work from home because it finds it doesn't need a major office block in a Seattle high rise. They only need one office for the boss and his secretary and everybody else works from their home and, and communicates via Zoom and does their job. So there's, going, there's a downward pressure on properties in Manhattan and especially with the, the mayor there, things are going pretty badly. So what, where am I going with all this? The traditional sources of cash to fund the liberal agenda in the Anglican Communion are being squeezed off. Now is the time, with change in leadership, uh, a weak Justin Welby, uh, a weakened Michael Curry, now is the time to seize the agenda, to seize control. But what I'm, do we see? Nothing. Well, now is, it's finally possible. Now the opportunity has arisen. Um, we went through this time, you know, the last 10 years, 15 years of Anglican news has been dominated by the liberal agenda. Uh, they have had success after success uh, here in the West, certainly over in the, the Church of England uh, most recently. And now they can be all arrested because the property market in China, which helps fund uh, the ACC, is gone. The, the ghost cities uh, uh, have turned out to be ghosts here in Manhattan. We're going to have ghost rentals. Uh, there's many of these Fortune 500 companies just don't want to pay that rent anymore. And they're doing just as well. They find that wor workers are more productive working uh, from home. And unless you are a person who works in a bakery who hands out food, there's just no <laughs> reason for you to go to work. Uh, my oldest daughter is a great example. She does fly around from customer to customer, but when she's at her home base, she works out of home. They don't bring her into the office. That money that was made in rents that helped fund the liberal agenda uh, with Trinity Wall Street and uh, 
the, the ghost cities of China, that's over. So we're seeing an income downturn. Mm -hmm. And this now allows the strengths of the Global South and GAFCON to be more valuable. In, the, in other words, strength in numbers. They yeah. can't pay their way, but they can certainly vote their way. But their votes only count if they show up. And because we're not seeing anything out of these synod statements of solidarity with ACNA or AMIE or anything like that, anything that could sort of indicate that they're concerned with something more than their own parochial interests, I'm not that sure that we're going to see any change and in, inertia will once again rule the Anglican world. George, let's move on to our next story. Let's talk about the CEEC and the Diocese of Christ for the sake of others. We mentioned last week, and I think we alluded to it the week before, that a priest was taking his church out of the Diocese of Christ for the sake of others, and he was going to move it to the CEEC, which will discuss what that means and what's defined and who the real CEEC is in a moment. But he was doing that because he thought that the ACNA was just too strict with its interpretation of how you deal with people who have same-sex attraction or want to have same-sex blessings and um, that. And he thought he could be more free in his interpretation of that and in teaching of that and leading his parish as a priest by going somewhere where those teachings and doctrine were less stringent, so to speak. And in doing so, the CEC, CEEC said, wait a minute, <laughs> hold on a second. We believe what the ACNA says. <laughs> so George, let's, let's try and delve into this story because we have CEEC archbishops responding uh, to Father Danny here. And the story is becoming very intriguing to me. Well, the first communication, as we mentioned in our last show, was from the continuing evangelical Episcopal churches, mm -hmm. uh, which said, nothing to do with us. That, we're not that CEEC. It's the other CEEC. Then Archbishop Quentin Moore of the uh, communion of evangelical Episcopal churches said, yes, we're the CEEC that St. Mary of Bethany in Nashville is going to be joining, but they haven't joined us yet, and we have uh, traditional views on marriage, but we allow clergy to believe whatever they want to believe. Hmm. So this is making it even, it's, it's a little bit even more confusing. So what's the, uh, why move? To an institution that on paper mm -hmm. is the same as the institution you're leaving except they're even less uh one of the things about the acna is its tolerance of different theological persuasions and you can leave the acna and move to another diocese move, move to another uh denomination for theology reasons and they allow you to agree to disagree why are you leaving for something that is essentially no different as far as I can tell in its official doctrines right. than the place you don't like. Mm. When you're under a bishop who is uh, very uh, accommodating to the point of view that you're describing. Yeah, I, this, this story it's not flowing out the way I think they expected it to. I think everybody said, okay, good. Father Danny's moving on. Uh, I thought the CEC would have some welcoming type letter. Yes, we, we welcome this parish from the ACNA, and we will let them practice what they uh, preach uh, in this new doctrine, in this new enlightenment, because the Holy Spirit is doing something new in this church. As far as I can tell, the only liturgical church uh, Father Danny could, Danny, Danny, uh, could have went to would have been the Episcopal Church. They would have accepted this. They would have said, come on in. Not only can you bless anything, we will help bless it for you. And... <laughs> Except for their bad luck. The Diocese yes. of Tennessee in Nashville is one of the few conservative dioceses for you. Uh, they they wouldn't be keen to have another pro-gay clergyman. They'd have you want to go to East Tennessee or West Tennessee, but not Tennessee. So, uh, oh, my. Yeah, so I also heard a rumor that uh, Christ for the sake of others requires their clergy to sign 
a uh, certificate saying that they would accept communion from a female clergy person. Have you heard yes, that as I, well? Yes, and but I've not heard whether this was given to one individual, mm -hmm. and basically this person is a troublemaker, and the bishop wants to nail this guy's uh, flag to the mast, uh, making him conform to their view of the of rightness of women's orders. Mm -hmm. Or if all clergy in this. So, friends, if you're uh, if you have information on this, do do so help us get set this story straight, because it's actually sort of funny to see the attitudes and hardening where you now have to sign uh, the Jerusalem Declaration, and now you've got to sign the uh, what the Todd Hunter Declaration <laughs> on women's orders and all these things and. Uh, uh, well, especially doesn't bode well for the ACNA's uh, continuing partnership with this one one group. No, it, it, it makes it more difficult, especially because of just the discussions the ACNA has had at an honest level for the last you know ten years. You know, they they sat down. We're going to discuss this. We're going to hash it out. We may not come to an answer, and they fully admit they haven't. Um, but this is where we are now. We don't know where we'll be in the future, but. Please understand, Church, that we're discussing this, and we know it's hard. And keep us in your prayers. So, we've heard again, and this is on the level of rumors because mm -hmm. I wasn't there, and I have no way of knowing. And Kevin wasn't there; uh, he is uh, in Mammoth Cave, Kentucky. Uh, the Gafcon primates were not in Kentucky uh, recently, but they had their meeting, and in Nairobi, and. Though they, re though they released a statement uh, saying that women's orders was a second order issue at Aephora, not uh, pretending to salvation, and Foley Beach then released a letter expressing his sadness about this development, I'm told that uh, the meeting was much more robust in its discussion, where it was pointed out that you promised to, to do X, and now you've done Y, mm -hmm. and why have you broken your oath to us and so I don't think this story is quite over um, again I can't prove this and no one will deny that uh, no one wants to be on the record as saying yes we beat the crap out of Jackson Archbishop Jackson uh, but from what we're told yes they did uh, pummel him on this point but basically came to the point well there's no use it can't be undone and we know where he's coming from with the, the diversity pressures he's has within his diet within his province which is under financial uh lure from america to sort of switch sides and go into the tech side so we have to cut him some slack on some areas but they're not happy this is not an issue where people are basically saying, okay we're done let's move to the next issue no they'll come back to this again and again and again but for the time being they've just tried to make up and keep the ball moving forward we want to remind gafcon that there may be some opportunities at the uh instrument of communion level that you may want to take interest in uh coming up and it would be a good time to have your act together to do this in unison george that's a that's a full show what we got here at 41 minutes we're cutting people slack this week unless you got something oh uh Scotland? my favorites what's that did Scotland, I miss one here? I don't have the list. The Scotland, where they're going to try over again, a do over. Oh yeah, yeah, do that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we've reported about the Bishop Aberdeen in Orkney, uh, Bishop Anne. Uh, a report found that she was basically a horrible bishop, terrible manager, not a nice person, and this was performed by an independent uh, review group. And then they had a human resource uh, person, independent, go through, and she essentially said the same thing and went on to say Bishop Ann Dyer pressured her to change the report to make it more favorable. Well, the bishops have said, we're now going to have a mediation steering group, another group to redo everything to make sure all voices were heard. So essentially what we're seeing is that the bishops in the Scottish Episcopal Church are going to keep repeating this independent study group until they finally get somebody who gives them a opinion that they want to have so folks 
the hypocrisy and the venality and the sheer uh, crapulous. Uh, well, I mean, this is this out of is, the Scottish College of Bishops is amazing. This is that quagmire we talked about with the, the London story. You know, they they're not getting the answer they want, and mm -hmm. they're going to keep it in quicksand, so to speak, until this turns out the way they want it to. And you know, they what's the the adage, if you have a couple of chimpanzees typing long enough, you will get to the works of uh, uh, Shakespeare. Well, that's what they're trying to do here. So, pretty disappointing. Mm. But to have the answer, well, whatever. Uh, I guess that's everything. Trinity Seminary has a dean that's retiring, and they're looking for a new one, George. Laurie Thompson, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. I served as, when I was in seminary, I served as his pastoral assistant when he was at Grace Church in Trumbull, Connecticut. And he's retiring after 20 plus years. Imagine it's, it's yeah, been that long. Yeah, one of the greats. As a, uh, not as dean, but as on this faculty and mm -hmm. then as dean. And they've appointed a uh, search committee led by Bishop uh, Archbishop Bob Duncan. Now, what is this search committee telling us? About 80% of the board of Trinity Seminary or ACNA, and 20% are, I think, Episcopal, and mm -hmm. maybe one or two others. The search committee is all ACNA. And so I think Trinity Seminary is basically reaching the decision, are we going to cut our links with the Episcopal Church entirely, or do we still want to have a, a line here or there to some diocese um, a few years ago, they uh, got rid of uh, uh, Greg Brewer, who's the Bishop of Central Florida, after there was a flap over Bishop Brewer intervening in the cathedral where a gay couple wanted to have their child baptized and the dean didn't act swiftly. And Bishop Brewer said, yes, go ahead and force the dean out and so on and so forth. And in re retaliation, the Greg Brewer, who had been on the faculty of Trinity Seminary, was dropped from its uh, either it's board or whatever the board yeah. position he had mm -hmm. and central florida which used to send a great many of its seminarians up there no longer does so mm -hmm. so the question is do they want to keep reaching out to episcopal diocese or do, do they just want to finally at the next iteration of a dean go forward uh free and clear so it'll yeah, be I, interesting to see what they do yeah i mean i think they would always take episcopal uh, seminarians, it's just who's going to send them there? Because uh, a bishop, in general, sends the seminarian. That hasn't changed yet, has it? No, uh, no, not really. I mean, in my time, uh, I was came out of the diocese of Pennsylvania, which is the city of Philadelphia and the surrounding mm -hmm. counties. And you know, the dean, uh, the bishop uh, at the time, uh, said you could go. To, uh, there are three seminaries. I will. Or you can go to uh, General Theological Seminary, Yale Divinity School, or uh, Episcopal Divinity School up in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. And so e you may go to that, any But even at the time, Virginia wasn't on the list? No, he would pay for me to go to one of those. Okay, three, that's all right. Where they would give me a bursary. Right. If I went, to, I could go anywhere I wanted, mind you, but I'd have to pay for it. But if I went to Trimony Seminary, I wouldn't be ordained. Okay. So, in other words, I could go to Trinity, Trinity Seminary, but it would be fruitless because the Diocese of Pennsylvania wouldn't ordain me. This is in the late, early 90s, late 80s. Sure. So, it's, all, it's, so it's always been politicized. Um, and, but yes, I think it's still pretty much bishops can obliquely basically determine where you go to seminary. They're not going to say, you may go here, you may not go there. They'll go, I'll make it easy if you go here. I'll make it miserable if you go there. Who's still recommending General Seminary? I, I wonder. <laughs> Just... Well, not many because they're well, New York City and yeah. New Newark, and because they're down to less than two dozen students. Yeah, it was. Uh, I it, believe. It's really low. So, and they're they're basically capitalizing on their real estate, and they've run out of money too. Um, yeah. uh, Yale doesn't have many left. Um, Virginia. Oh, the Yale. Don't don't worry about Yale. Yeah, Yale's money. got yeah. more money than they know what to do with it. They do. Yale yeah. waxes and wanes. It waxes yeah. and wanes. It it has great times. It has miserable times. It just depends who's teaching there at the moment. Because good students flock to under be under good teachers, 
And I mean, that's why I went to Yale, frankly, because the best teachers in the communion were there at, at that time. At that time. No, they did have the best, absolutely. Uh, but especially that, New Testament and Old Testament. Yeah, uh, and my, uh, you know, Harvard has got a great name, but who would want to go there? Because there's nobody really of great stature standing mm -hmm. who, uh, that you would study under there. Uh, VTS, Virginia Theological, I, 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 yeah. I, I mean, it was never on my radar, so I don't yeah. know. Okay. All right, so that's this week's show. Not this week's show, that's today's show. There may be another show on Friday if we can get all the technology working on time and in time. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 689 of Anglican Unscripted.